What's going on, folks? As you're coming into the room, just let me know that you're here. My guest is in the building. He's making himself comfortable getting ready for us to have this talk. Happy Sunday to everybody. And uh, tonight I'm hoping for a very spirited conversation with a very tan talented individual. Somebody who has put a lot of years and hard work and experience behind mastering his craft. And he comes to us from Brooklyn by way of California. You know, we love to, to salute our people who, you know, come from our part of town. So I hope everybody's going to enjoy this conversation. And uh, not only that, but this is a, I believe this is a long time coming um, that I sit down with this gentleman. It's been a lot of years that have gone by, but I'm very happy to see that he's doing exactly what he's wanted to do with his life. And um, if you've done any research or look behind the music, man, you can see that the talent is there, the experience and all the work that he's put in um, has put him in the position that he is now. So I hope everybody else out there is going to enjoy the conversation. Salute to my guy, Mr. Tom Ford. In the building, yes, there's a piece of history right here, Tom. We're going to talk about it all. Um, but let me take this down before we start this show. Um, salute to everybody in the building. Um, so before I run this track, let me just share a few things and then, um, we're going to get this show started quickly. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm not going to say waste too much time, but I want to get to this story. Um, first and foremost, shout out to my guy, uh, Mr. Julian, the Thundercat answer, who's going to be fighting September 17th, um, here in New York city. He's going to be fighting at the grand Roosevelt ballroom. Um, in Yonkers. So if you can, if you want to see some good fights, man, go get your tickets and uh, support our guy, man. He's building his his career and his brand. This young man has dedicated his life to fighting. He's a great fighter and he's also a good dude. He contributes to the community in a lot of Stop the Violence movements, movements out on Staten Island. So salute to our guy, Mr. Julian, the Thundercat answer. And also, uh, I want to wish my niece i call her stinky but she's she's too grown for that so uh my niece angelica morales a very happy birthday um i love you and i hope you continue doing what you're doing with yourself keep growing keep progressing and keep being the best version of yourself that you can be and lastly um i want to give a special shout out um it's leo season um, so I want to give a special shout out to this young lady. If everybody was watching the Chop It Up, Miss B. Chanel, um, a very happy birthday to her. Head over to her Instagram. Uh, Smile Shit Happens, as ironically as that name is. It's her birthday tomorrow. So salute to all the Leos in the building and everybody out there celebrating. Um, and with that said, we're going to run this track and get this show started because I definitely want to jump into this conversation. So let's go. So, yo, this is Red Man in the building. Right now, you are checking out my boy, Mr. A, at the set. Talking about real life education, community, addiction, and just real people in general. So, Mr. A, let's get this shit going on. Light your blunts, fasten your seat belts, and squeeze on your girl titty. Ow! Mr. A, at the set, is starting now. <laughs> That's Paul for the course. Um... Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Mr. A, and this is The Set 6145. Tonight, a very, very, very special guest, um, a Mr. Genesee Lewis. And I know I'm tearing his name up. He could correct me when he comes in the room, but um, this gentleman is an artist, producer, songwriter. He's put in a lot of work, and he's been at it a very long time. So I hope that everybody that's in the building is going to enjoy this conversation there's so much to, to to get to, so I'm not gonna hold you. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hold him. Um, so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, or oh, let me let me drop a couple of clues bombs because this is well deserved. From Brooklyn by way of California, producer, artist, MC, Mr. Genesee Lewis. 
Yo. Peace. <laughs> What's going Mr. on? Mr. Ace, salute, my brother. How you feeling? I'm good. How you doing, sir? Man, everything's beautiful on my end. Can't complain, man. Blessed. I know you got all that wonderful weather, too. <laughs> man, it's been too hot out here, bro. It's oh, way, yeah? Yeah, it's been blade 95 every day for like 20 days in a row. And then it's like 60 at night? Yep. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Probably got that funny weather, man. When I went out there, um, we were in the Bay Area, um, and I caught a little jet lag, so I went to sleep. And I woke up, I think it was about 8.30. So it's, right. it's, it's August. So I roll up. I get fresh. I'm like, all right. As soon as I open the door, I was like, nah, son. <laughs> <laughs> I got to back it out. Nah, this ain't good. <laughs> yeah, bro. It's crazy. Yeah. So first and foremost, yo, thank you for, for, for giving us your time. Um, there's so much to get to in this conversation. Um, I posted your song. I, I was sifting through your music for the last bro. week. And I bro. found... Yeah, I found this joint that I posted on Instagram. Um, and it just in that moment, me actually listening to it, the, the deadly a uh, deadly light in Brooklyn. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I was like, yo, this song speaks to me on so many different levels. Right. First and foremost, because the quality of of penmanship, cadences, mm -hmm. and, and how you put it all together. That's that's New York shit, right? Off top. And secondly, whenever you know a Brooklyn MC, a New York MC, there's a lot of truth behind what he's telling. So when I listened to the joint, I was like, mm, okay. And lastly, there are not, and I wanted to tell you this, there are not many artists that are still carrying the torch of what it really means to be an MC. Yeah, we the last Jedis, man, for real. And it's it's sad, but I'm still I'm still very heartened by the fact that there are, if you look, absolutely, it's out there. artists that yeah. are still delivering real MC. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So let's start with this. How does the trans the transplant or the transformation from Brooklyn to California? How does that happen to you? Like, what is the motivation behind you making the move? Yeah, I mean, it's actually a deadly night in Brooklyn. That was that was my biggest motivation. You know, I felt my hand was kind of forced, you know. Mm -hmm. And plus, I had already, you know, I graduated high school and just wasn't really doing nothing but just getting in trouble and going to the clubs and running around, you know, doing dirt. And um, it was like, you know, sometimes the, the worst things that happen to you turn out to be the best things. You know, it's like there's a blessing in disguise, you know what I mean? So it got me out of Brooklyn at 19 and it got me out to Cali and, you know, into a different mind state. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, I was born in California and I had lived there with my mom up until like uh, seven years old. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, I had a little bit of familiarity with some spots, you know, actually in the Bay area where you were visiting. So, yeah. So okay. came back up there and, and, you know, just my love for hip hop is what, is what got me through like all, all those rough times, you know, and like hip hop was always like an outlet for us. And it's crazy because in golden era, when we were living, like we didn't, we didn't even know what we right. were living in. You know what I'm saying? Now, when you look back, you're like, wow, like we were so lucky to grow up in that time where, where hip hop was just thriving and it was amazing. You know what I mean? And yes, sir. I don't, yeah. So, so it was a trip though. So that's, that's what got me out. So, so let me ask. I would have been dead or in jail or you know, some, or who knows what if I would have stayed. Were you when you were in New York? Were you in? Were you living in East Flatbush? Nah, nah, I was in Bay Ridge. Oh, you were in Bay Ridge. Yeah, bro. Yeah, RNS, bro. Oh, yeah, well, come oh, on, bro. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Yeah. For some reason, I had this feeling like you was living in East Flatbush during that time. I don't know why. I don't know where that came from. But yeah. So, so when you move out to Cali, is it? Do you become acclimated right away or is it like a tough start for you? Because you, you're sort of starting off new from scratch. Right. You know, I had a, like there was a lot of emotional trauma at that time. You know what I mean? Like what mm -hmm. I was going through because I went through what I went through. And then then when I came out here, like I had to go back because because I had a warrant for attempted murder for me. Mm. You know what I mean? So I had to go back and face the judge and and lawyer up and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So. It was like I was, bro, I was having panic attacks. Like I just was going through it, man. You know, I was only 19 and just thrown through the ringer. And honestly, it wasn't easy. You know what I'm saying? Right. 
Yeah. So you was know. it? A, did you in that moment? Because I know some. I know a lot of people. I know people. You know, both. You can relate on both sides. You know, people that have done bids, long oh, bids, short man. bids, coming in and out, whatever, still hitting the street. Yeah. Was that a teachable moment? Like, did did you become grounded in that moment and say, "Yo, you know what? It's time to to go left because this." Mm -mm. It's not you know what? Yeah, I think it was just like the survival instincts. You know what yeah. I mean? Deep down in your DNA, it's just like, <laughs> yo, if you if you stay there, it's not. You know, there's no future. You right. know what I mean? Right. And I was already, I was already like thinking about moving out to Cali and getting back out there and and starting something. You know, so okay, it was kind of felt. You know, my once my hand got forced, it's just like the universe and you know, just working, working towards that. You know, so. Yeah, and bro. Do you feel like uh, were there ever times in the change when you were going through that process? Because it sounds like you had a, a moment of clarity dealing with this whole legal issue, making mm -hmm. the move and going back. Did you ever feel like you wanted to veer away from music or were you dead set? I'm focused. This is what I'm doing. Well, the thing is, it's like I wasn't really making music when I was in Brooklyn. OK. You know, I was I was behind the scenes with RNS and, you know, taking everyone to all the clubs and, and I was right there. But I hadn't really picked up my pen fully. Okay. You know, Ch Charlie, Charlie Hustle was, you know, he was my mentor. And, you know, we used to sit there and take Kooji raps rhymes and write them on the loose leaf and study them like the Bible, you know, like really like dive into the art of MC. And so he taught me like a lot of the foundation of of what I brought out to Cali. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, yeah you know. Let's let's say salute to RNS because RNS definitely had a, their moment in the sun, and they definitely were building a strong following. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was an amazing Barber, time. Yeah, Tom, shout out to Diego, my brother, all for life. Charlie Hustle. Yeah, yep. those, those three brothers really had their moment, and it, and I believe had they come together more solidly, they could yeah. have been like. Uh, uh, an iteration of what Mob Deep became. Man, absolutely. Absolutely. They were talented. Yeah, and even the factions that came from it, like the Struck and Icon, and you know what I mean? There were there were things. Kenny Dope, you know, did a great job of of getting us out there, pressing up the wax and, you know, getting it on Stretch and Bob and all that good stuff. So there were, we, sure. yeah, we definitely had like some amazing moments performing with Wu-Tang and Mob Deep and <laughs> Beefing with Mob Deep. Yeah, I'm just, <laughs> you know I was going to tell you. Yeah, like, talking about it. Showboat uh, and showboat. Yeah, that was the legendary <laughs> night, bro. Yeah. It's funny because I was I, there. <laughs> I forget which Wu, one of the Wu members. I forget who it was. Brought up the showboat incident, and they were Word. like, "Yeah, these Puerto Rican dudes was crazy." <laughs> you know? But that's a that's an urban legend. That that whole incident, like the a man. lot of people know about that. Hey, for it's real, crazy. for <laughs> so, real, bro. So you get out to Cali and you settle in. Yeah, I'm settling now, in. Yep. Do you hit the ground running? Like, how does it all start for you to start really digging yourself into the music? Man, so it was 93, bro. Illmatic just dropped. Oof. 36 Chambers just dropped. You know, Tribe was bumping. Like, it was Souls of Mischief, 93. Tim Affinity was right there where I would just moved out to. So it was so inspiring. And then, you know, I was healing from all that trauma. So I think like when, you know, it was just like a natural, I needed the outlet. I needed something to, you know, to, to release, you know? Right. And, and yeah, I was always a writer. Like, you know, I always like through school, you know, straight A's and all that. I'll be writing all types of, you know, the love letters for the girls, you know, they'd hit me up. Yo, 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 Jen, help me with like, this letter. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah, so I was always a writer, and yeah, then I just, you know, I had wrote my first rhyme actually before, before I left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before I left, I had I had written it, but I, you know, I never recorded it or nothing like that. But since so, I had that, and I remember getting the cream instrumental, and then mm -hmm. I had my little karaoke machine, and bro, like I tried it out, and I, you know, I played it for my homies, and they're like, "Yo, yo, this is crazy," you know, and so I just started going. And that, that that was it. Yeah, then the ball was running. I was off to the races. Mm. So now you start, you finally put a composition together. You record something. You get this mm -hmm. feedback that you were like quality, right? Like you sort of get stamped. 
by your people that are around you. Right. Now, what What is the experience for you like when you first get in the studio? Because rapping in ciphers and all that, and yeah. then going to a studio and having to learn choruses and overdubs and all the, all of that could be a lot, and it could be intimidating. Right. Right. So mm -hmm. is your first experience in a studio? Is it comfortable? Like, what is the experience for you like? Yeah. You know, I know. I wish I could remember the first time because recording studios were like they weren't easy accessible the way they are now where everyone has. You know what I mean? Like you had to pay. You had to pay a lot of money. And, you know, so we had a we had a four track, though. We had a Tascam four Task track with the tape. Yeah, bro. Yeah. So we had we had the opportunity to perfect our art as much as work we wanted to put in, which was, you know, 20 hours a day, we'd be on there recording and, and, you know, making our first songs. Um, mm. My boy Elronius, he's a, a legendary West Coast MC out here. He, you know, he really, he kind of found me. He was a couple years older than me and, you know, kind of discovered me and put me on the scene, mm. you know, and like taught me how to, uh, how to, how to start your own independent record label and how to, hit up bill smith and get your wax pressed up and then take it 10 records at a time to amoeba records and zebra records and they sell 10 you bring 10 back you know what i mean you keep flipping mm. them and flipping them so like yeah it was it was amazing learning the ropes i was fortunate to learn all the all that stuff in my first run in the music biz you know what i mean so i learned the yeah. foundation of of you know even writing stuff off on taxes and and like everything about you know running a business so mm -hmm. we were doing it as, as you know, pretty much kids. Right. So, yeah. But I think that um, I can gather from what you're saying that a lot of people don't understand that the street business is transferable to the business world. 100%, bro. Once you learn, like you have the hustle. Yeah. You know how to keep the money and you know how to stack and do all these things. Yeah. All you need to know is the legalities of how the inside mechanics of how things work. And learning that paperwork, that's it. and you're good, especially right? with wax. It's all units. So if you could chop up a pea, you could chop up, you know, a thousand, <laughs> a thousand units of wax, and see where you can dis distribute, you know, distribution. It's all, it's all the same, man. That's why cats like you know Jay Z are just so successful in this world because they take that street hustle mentality and apply it into the boardrooms. You know, yeah, it's it's a dangerous combo. Yeah, it, that, I've always said that mm -hmm. the most dangerous people in this world when it comes to business are people from the street. If street dudes was to translate and get, and I'm not necessarily one for like higher learning, but I mm -hmm. think that if dudes in the street were to go and get acclimated in, in academia and become mm -hmm. like, get some letters after their name. Yes. They would, they would be vicious yes. business. Absolutely. You know, plus they harder to say no to. <laughs> For real. <laughs> speaking of speaking of uh those types of people, salute to my guy, uh Minnesota for Moneyball's players in the BX, man. Salute, man. He got another project coming out called Sidewalk Exec Executive that I'm hoping to see drop very soon. Dope. Um, so you start to make these moves, and is it instant? Like, are you just pushing yourself at this point, or you started to see a bigger picture? Like, I'm gonna take this and make it a bigger business like independent bro we were underground hip-hop we didn't want to know we didn't want nothing to do with no major labels or we would oh, wow. yeah, I, i've never signed a deal you know i'm a real mc you know what i mean like we wasn't about we wasn't about that we was about the culture and and you know just getting our music out there and it definitely changed throughout the years you know what i mean our perspective and our goals that we had set for ourselves regarding music and and the business side of it right but back then no, bro. Nah, we was, bro. We was just, we it's was just, us. we wanted to go battle cats across the world. And you know what I mean? Like, we, yeah, <laughs> uh -huh. we, yeah that's it, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel like when you look onto the landscape now, because, you know, just speaking to you, um, it's nostalgic. I feel that energy and I remember that time and the place that we were in. Likewise. We were growing up with this music that was just historical. Right, yeah, the create the, the levels of creativity that people were putting out was just insane, exactly. And the now, you lyrical content, ex wow, exactly. Yeah, and now you look out into the landscape. How do you do, like, are you fans of new music? 
because man, I'm, like you said, it's out there. There's some great stuff. I mean, as far as new music, uh, this it's rough. Like, you know, I feel I feel stuff, and I don't really listen to a lot of stuff. Uh -huh. And I couldn't tell you ninety percent of the rappers <laughs> right now. Well, honestly, I couldn't even tell you. Like, I know about ten percent of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you know, if I hear something I like, I'll dive into a little bit. You know what I mean? To check it out and. You know, I think like my IG, like they got my my algorithm that they, you know, aim towards me. You know, yeah, they, yeah. They, what they shoot me all the time on my feed is underground hip hop of new cats mm -hmm. doing some throwback sound and stuff. And I'll be yeah. loving that. I'll be finding some gems like, whoa, these guys are crazy. Like they doing this now, you know, like I'm going to DM these cats and get them some beats. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> let's keep this. Let's keep this torch burning. You know, yeah, there is a group. Uh, one of the members, I believe, is Ras Cast's son. Yeah, oh my goodness, bro! Cost Contra, uh, Con I yeah, Costa Contra, yeah, bro. That one thing where they're rapping on either side of the table, and he's telling that story about when he went to that party. Uh huh. Hot, hottest thing of the year. That Dude, was the hottest thing of the whole year. Period. When I saw that, I felt, I felt hope. Yes, yes. You know what I mean? Yes, I yes, yes. Because the landscape, I mean, there are MCs that are out there. You know, you have Kendrick, you have J. Cole. Yeah. And 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 respectfully, I can't really say Drake's name. Man, I would say Drake. Drake's an amazing MC when it he, comes down to it at the end of the day. He's a yeah. great artist. Yeah. I, I, ever since the ghostwriting thing, I'm just like a little like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I you get know, it. It's part, it's part of the game nowadays, man. Take it from somebody who wrote for a lot of people. You know what I mean? It's, that's, yeah. That They're was smart. my next question. They're yeah. smart. They're smart for including another writer. They shouldn't be frowned upon. They should be congratulated. Like, oh, wow. in, my, in my opinion. Really? Yeah, yeah. Because he's not making, he's making pop records that are <laughs> playing in, you know, pool parties in Dubai. You know what I mean? So right. having somebody like a big songwriter sit in and, 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 you know, switch up some words. It's, I've seen the way that the labels work and, and that works. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it actually, it's a successful procedure. Oh, so you're not, writing. you don't feel like I feel like a, I'm, I'm, I'm an MC purist to a degree. I feel, no, I feel you. I get where you, I get your perspective. Of but you're saying from a, from a business perspective, it makes sense. Yeah, from a business and some even from a song, song maker perspective. Okay. Okay. Because you can, you know, you can sweeten up the pot. Sometimes you add a little different flavor mm -hmm. and you know, Things little change. little sazon with the adobo and yeah, it could you, you <laughs> go up. <laughs> I um I was having a discussion now that we're we're touching on this. Uh -huh. I was having a discussion with uh, a gentleman and I told him Honestly, because we were talking about favorite MCs like, uh, you know, Mount Rushmore type shit, top five, yeah, all yeah. that dude, right? Yeah. And I said, listen, for me, it's rock him and then everybody else. Wow. I, I don't have to just, you know, it's the God MC. The God, he, man. He, for me, is he birthed Nas. He birthed Black Dog. He, he birthed me. He birthed me. He birthed, he birthed, he birthed, he birthed, he birthed Charlie. Yeah. Most yeah. deaf. He both, mm -hmm. uh, rest in peace, MC Blink. Yeah. He, birthed a, he birthed the lyrical MC. Yes. And you got to think, this is the 80s. Rakim yes. is in the 80s. Incredible. Yep. You Incredible. know? Incredible. Yep. So in, in that perspective, I'm very much a purist. So he, his point to me was, well, what if you heard that he had a ghostwriter? And I was Ra like, oh, Rakim? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. I was like, oh, I'd be brokenhearted. Wow. He's like, why? I'm like, because of who he is. He's always, I just heard a freestyle he did over The World Is Yours. When I say this man was in his pocket. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's what his, that was his thing. His pocket was just all oh, beats and boom pass. We're not all jogging. You walk all head to watch a car get crazy. Dude, just locked in. You know what I mean? Like his cadence, bro, it's, it's unmatched, bro. And with his lyrics too, I used to write them all down mm -hmm. on a loose leaf paper and sit there at the dinner table with my parents and make my parents like, yo, mom, listen to what this man is saying. Like this kid, this guy's a genius. Like, listen, mm -hmm. he's talking about ancient civilizations and, and knowledge and power and uplifting the community. Like, listen, listen, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, <laughs> Do yeah. you, so, so, so you get involved in the underground scene in Cali and I mm -hmm. know that un, like 
Cali is somewhat like New York's cousin when it comes to hip hop. Right. Yeah. It started here in New York City, but the way they embrace the culture out there is very parallel to the way we love hip hop in the form that we do. Right. So are you what is the scene like when you get in? Bro, there? bro, no, it's night and day. Really? Bro, it was complete culture shock. Oh, wow. oh my God. It took them took a quite many years, bro, to to get acclimated and and comfortable out here because it's like I was straight straight BK East Coast you know dude uh -huh. just and I come out here and I hear sir too short straight from Oakland California home of the rock and you know I was on some lyrical miracles you know what I mean it was it was Joe it was so different and then listen to E40 for the first time and I'm like bro what is this bro this is like this is different. <laughs> yeah. It's different because we have just been introduced, you know, our our generation to the mm -hmm. to the West Coast sound for real, for real. Because Dre and Snoop had just dropped the right. Chronic, and they were they were playing that. Hot. They were playing that. Yeah, they were playing that in you know in New York on the radio on Hot ninety seven when we when I was uh you know my last year in like ninety three before I bounced out, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. the clubs and everything. They were playing Tupac. I get around uh, in, you know, in the Palladium and home base. You know what I'm saying? Yo. Y yeah. New York City, <laughs> if you know what it is. My guy just said home base. Wow. <laughs> oh, <laughs> now I feel man, <laughs> bro. We had them thing. The Muse, bro. We had them spots <laughs> locked down, bro. Oh We'd be God. up there. We'd be up there like 30, 40 deep, bro. Everybody from Sunset was just out there wilding. Bro, so crazy. <laughs> so, so how do you get adjusted to this new yeah, so environment? I was just doing me. You know what I mean? Because I realized, here's another thing. When New Yorkers touch down in Cali, we cool as fuck. <laughs> we the cool motherfuckers. You know what I mean? Like right. a lot of cats is goofy. You know what I mean? Like a lot of cats, is it's just different. And we're like these smooth, like, you know, we treat women really nice you know everyone's on some pimp stuff out here in cali and we're like the the gentlemen you know what i'm saying yeah. and and it's it was just a whole different like not only with the music but within the culture and the streets the streets everything was just different bro it was it was it was tough man it was tough bro i'm still adjusted you feel me so the reception was a little yeah, this the, yeah, bro. Like uh, I had cats on, like one of my first shows, like Boomy, Boomy, and I'm up there with Elronius, who's like a really respected pillar of the hip hop community. You know what I'm saying? And the cat, cats up there booing me, like, "Yo, go back to New York." You know what I'm saying? Oh, so wow. I, yeah, it, that only happened once. That only happened once, and that was real early in the game. And yeah, other than that, like it was open arms. They were like, "Yo, this." They were. They was. They was. They was digging my sound. And plus, I teamed up, you know, my first group on that wax that we dropped, Double Life. I teamed up with Elronius, and he had like a, you know, freestyle. He's part of the Freestyle Fellowship crews and all the, you know. Oh, you know okay. Yeah, yeah. those are my homies, AC Alone. And these are my guys that we used to spar with during that era, like a little bit after we released. Oh, like wow. we all, yeah, we all lived in a crib together in the Bay, went on tour, everything. Yeah, this is my guys. So, yeah, L, L, so L had a West Coast sound. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, I, I had like a straight East Coast sound. So we had and that's why that was the whole c concept of double life, because, you know, we were like the best of both coasts. And and so that was real helpful in introducing me to the underground hip hop scene. Mm. Yeah. So as time's going on, are you starting to are your thoughts to how you're involved in the culture starting to evolve and like bigger picture scenarios for yourself as far as business is concerned? Like, you, do you start to say, okay, I love this culture. I love what I'm doing. How do I make money from it? Yeah, so that happened a little on down the line um, when I started mm -hmm. making beats. So, like, I would say, like, two, three years after that, mm -hmm. and I, I caught my first MPC and started making my own beats and, you know, played them, got the great reception from the homies and to my other MC homies. I was lacing them up and giving away beats for free, you know, and then then all of a sudden I was like, all right, now, it's, you know, it's time to start charging a little something. 
<laughs> How did yeah. that feel taking that fresh out the box when you first copped that? Bro, bro <laughs> it was great because, you know, dude, we were selling beats to all the, you know, all the ballers. They were all, because they were all the, you know, all the drug dealers were turning into rappers at that point. And cats, mm-hmm. well, you know, cats, you know, yo, let me get, you know, let me get five beats and throw, you know, throw 1500 <laughs> in your face. And I was like, then I was like, oh, okay. That's, I know what I need to do right now. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and- so you go from 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 rhyming to now you're producing beats. Mm-hmm. Um, what's your first big break, like business wise? Yeah, yeah. So it was right around that same time. Um, my buddy Prozac Turner, he he came and recorded a couple songs. Uh, he got a budget to so back in the days, this is how it worked, record labels. They would actually give you a budget to record a demo. <laughs> Can you believe that? So you're getting paid. To try. You're getting paid to try to get signed. What everybody's doing for free nowadays. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, sorry. so he came and tore me off. You know, tore me off like 500 a beat for a few beats to um to make this demo. You know what I mean? I got a couple little checks from DreamWorks. Nice. You know, which was amazing. And um, so he brought the record back back to uh to DreamWorks and they signed him. Oh wow! And they and they opened the budget and that was when labels were paying bro yeah so can you hear my my text dinging by any chance no i don't hear okay cool okay cool cool. perfect perfect yeah so um yeah because it's going crazy i was making sure (laughs) yes so dude so they signed them and ended up using three of my songs oh wow uh yeah on the album and dude, so he got a big budget he went and got the alchemist jay dilla me Oh. You heard? Yeah. So this is Prozac Turner, the artist I'm referring to. You can, if you wanted to reference. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, um, yeah, he, he went and got all uh, Super Dave West, all the, you know, best producers in the game at that time. Right. And still to this day. <laughs> so those are legendary. Yeah, exactly. Legendary. Exactly. So, so man, I went to, I was watching eight mile with my homies. We went to the <laughs> movies. I came home, I opened up my mailbox. Like I do, you know, right before I step into the door, Open it up. There was a check for ten grand from uh, from DreamWorks. So they, yeah, they were breaking off five Gs for each beat. Oh wow! So so I ended up they gave me ten up front, and then like they gave me five later on. So yeah, that was I was like, okay, wow. And this is a this is a time when gentrification was really happening a lot in San Francisco where I was living, right? So oh. it, we were getting forced out, and. Um, we ended up finding this spot like across the Bay Bridge in in El, uh, in Richmond, El Cerrito, which is like right next to Oakland and Berkeley. Right, all right. And um, bro, I just took that money and I bought I bought you know a G four, which was the brand new at the time. Pro Tools, the Rode NT two, so you know KRK monitors and you know some, some soundproofing. Yeah, man. So I went in and and built the whole studio, man, and. I wasn't even rhyming a lot at this point, bro, because I was because I was being so rewarded by making beats. You know what I'm saying? And I had spent like the last the last eight years performing, you know, for a hundred bucks a night. You know what I'm saying? And every performing four times a week, we we did every single you know venue in San Francisco ten times and open up for every big act that came through. And wow. you know what I mean? Like I was yeah. So I would and. And that wasn't really, you know, paying dividends as much. It was making us local celebrities, you know, and it was giving us props. And, and you know, we were having a lot of fun. It was the best times of our life, you know. But at that point, the business was starting to kick in. And and I was, you know, I was starting to write. I was starting to write R&B songs around this time, too. Like my first R&B songs, because my record label that I formed in my family, Noble House, um, had uh, two amazing female artists in it. Uh, which uh, they were a group together called Chemistry that I founded. So it was Genevieve, Genevieve, who went on to uh, uh, have her own show on Disney called Choo Choo Soul. Um, and she's she's a really, she's an amazing artist and human and Kayla D as well. So I started writing a little bit R&B and I, so I was just kind of like growing, you know, growing into a different, into a different kind of music dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah, You're evolving as a musician. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, and the fact of the matter is that your talent was th- like the foundation of who you were was already there, and you were just building upon it. And now you're exploring new sort of vehicles of music. All right. Yeah, right. Let me find. I could, if I could get a check here, maybe I could get a check over there. 
been going. You know I mean? exactly. And that's a, that's a great thing. A lot of people, you know, a lot of people will get into the business or or make music and they're just like, oh, I don't do hip hop. I don't do that that R and B shit. And you would be surprised. Well, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of other people would be surprised to come and find out that make, a lot of their hip hop producers that are their favorites have produced some ballads, uh-huh. R and B, you know, even even pop music. Absolutely. You know what I mean? That's yep. a check. That's a check. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Like I, I, you know, I grew up admiring, uh, you know, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and and all. <laughs> You know what I mean? All the, you know, you know, Kenny Dope was our first producer. So we, we was hanging out at Todd Terry's house in, in Jersey when he was doing Cher's big first record with auto tune. You know what I'm saying? So I was yeah. exposed. And then, you know, plus growing up, growing up and, in, in, you know, backstage with all these crazy rock, rock legends, you know, like it was it was in me already. Right. So it was finally it was ready to come out. You know what I'm saying? So you start exploring this new genre at that time right now does it take that turn and you start jumping into that more or do you turn backwards and you start developing more and more into the hip-hop like sound of your own so to speak man the hyphy movement is what Mm. happened the hyphy movement hit the bay area and i was one of the spearheads so i was you know doing a lot of the production behind the scenes and working with all the the hyphy artists and Mm. it was just like it was a crazy time like the bay area's energy was just uh-huh. electric wow. electric off the hyphen movement there's you know people just they're shutting down the bay 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 bridge and swinging donuts and everyone's going crazy and we're all you know we're all young and drinking and partying and it was dude it was just like an energy to get caught up in and so i spent a lot of time doing that stuff Mm-hmm. Right. But me and Kayla D, I, I had always had my R&B artists that I was developing and working with at the time, too. Uh-huh. And so we did a couple of songs and all of a sudden uh, Kayla D was like, yo, um, these cats in L.A. want to sign me uh, to a publishing deal. And um, I think I'm going to do it. And I was like, word up. Let's go. Yeah. So she signed and then she submitted like her first 10 songs and they they realized that I was like, you know, behind all the songs, you know what I mean? Both <laughs> produced them and wrote them and all that stuff. So they were like, yo, let's set up a meeting for your boy. You know what I mean? And um, wow, I, I, yeah, I went down there and I negotiated for like nine months, bro, back and forth to try to get a good a good contract. I paid, gave my lawyer mostly all my advance, which was a nice chunk, but he ended up getting it at the end of the day just to get me into a proper deal. Oh, wow. Where I wasn't where I wasn't getting robbed, you know what I mean? And so we signed with Cobalt. I don't okay. know if you're familiar with Cobalt Publishing. They were a little tiny, small boutique type publisher when they signed us back then. Uh-huh. And then they blew up, bro. Like they just sold, they just sold it for like some crazy, like 800 million, something ridiculous like that. Yeah, bro. Really? <laughs> yeah. So wow. So during this time, are you like because I I New York dudes are more familiar now with the hyphy movement, and yeah, you know, we we got to see it after the fact, so to speak, on the on the other end, right? Right. But you being in that moment while it's happening, like, how does that all come to be? Because I know a lot of New York dudes don't under I didn't understand what the hyphy movement was about anyway. You know, our <laughs> side shows and yeah, who's wanna, sure. like, how does that? All, who was the originator of the hyphy movement? I, guess I mean, that's a that's a great question. I would have to say it's Mac Dre. So what had happened was, is that um, my boy Scooby uh, Jonas, peace out, he, he brought Mac Dre to my house. And Mac, so you got to understand, Mac Dre is a legend in the Bay Area, in the, oh, streets, yeah. in the streets. And, you know, he had just came home from doing doing like five years for armed robbery. It might even been longer. I'm not sure. He was in there for a minute, bro. So he was he was he had just came out and his beat selection he's a genius dude a musical genius bro rest in peace to my guy you know and he um dude he uh would pick these weird beats bro and rap real weird on them like you know my name is Farrell. i'm the owner of the building i'm a stoner and i'm chilling i'm burning in the ceiling or you like dude it's like almost like on some but though like lyrically it's almost like with shady like like the way he's putting syllables together is like it's some real mc like he's a a raw motherfucker you know what i'm saying Uh but and then he just had like the facial expressions and the dances and the cars and the wardrobe and everything the big stunning glasses everything to go with it and 
and it was really all part of the culture of what was going on. You know what I mean? I don't even know who put the tag on it, Hyphy, and did that. But me and Mr. Fab, who's my very good friend, um, we, we were working on our album together. We have a whole album together. Hold that thought for a second. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching the show, I, I got to pause for a second because <laughs> my guy is dropping historical fucking names, you know, from working with people, knowing people through work and all this other shit. These, this is historical hip hop right here. So I, I just had to bomb on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to drop these bombs on you right now because, you know, I don't think people are really catching it because I'm sitting here and I'm going, hold up a second. Does this one really knows who you're talking Like, these are big names behind big points of the culture of hip hop. Yes. And I wasn't, I knew I was coming to hear a great story, right? I didn't expect this. Peace. Oh. Yeah, nah, I'm, I, yo, I'm like the Forrest Gump of hip hop, son. <laughs> like I'm connected to every, you know, every wild subway, shape I, and form. Like you know, I you know, hear it. you know, Charlie D and Tone had me in the lab with Punt, you right. know, bless his soul. And and after the studio session, it was when he was recording a pack in the Mac in the back of the act skit. You uh -huh. heard, <laughs> dude. After the studio session, um. He, everyone had a cipher, you know, everyone was there, Cuban and Sace and, 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 you know, Charlie and Icon and uh -huh. they were, and, and they were like all having a cipher. And I, dude, that was like, right when I was, I was a straight underground rapper and I was like, damn, these motherfuckers is all spitting these murder bars, bro. And like, I got this save the planet shit. You know what I'm saying? Bro? Yeah, 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 yeah. Bro, yo. So I went home, dude, I went home back to Cali after that trip to New York. And I literally wrote a hundred songs about <laughs> how I'm the rawest fucking MC you ever heard, and you whack as fuck. <laughs> bro, <laughs> <yo>. <laughs> so yeah, sorry to go on a tangent, but that was just no, a little, no, 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 no. Yeah, that was just a little thing that that reminded me when it, you said that. Yeah, about pun, I had to drop the pun lug in there. It's, he it's, changed my life. Changed my life as an MC. Those moments, yeah, right. Those moments, and, yes. And, and, and clarity, I'm, like you said. Yeah, that that moment mm -hmm. of clarity. Yes, it's crazy because I think about all this time, like what was going on and where everybody was. You know what I'm saying? And to bring it to this moment right now, right? Like what I'm doing, what you're doing, and this conversation, and how everything is sort of like six degrees of separation. Yeah. Bro. It is really, really fucking crazy. It's wild. Nah, it's wild. It's psychedelic. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so now you're in the hyphy movement. All these things are happening. Like when you when you line up your deal, mm -hmm. right? You get your deal straight. What is the first project or artist that you put out under that deal? So I wasn't, I was the worker at that point. I wasn't right. the boss no more. You know what oh, I'm saying? Yeah, uh, yeah, so no, but no, it was my life changed immediately. They started flying me to LA every week to go and work with, you know, to go man. write for Britney Spears and Rihanna and Black Eyed Peas and, and you know what I mean? I never made it, we almost made it on Rihanna's album, bro. I ha they had our shit on hold for like a year. And then uh, Chris, Christopher Cross wouldn't clear the sample. I don't know if you remember this, this song from Arthur. When you get caught between the moon and New, New York, York City. City. Well, of course. Yeah, bro. Of course so, was big. Yeah, so yeah, they wouldn't clear that and kind of mess wow. us up. But yeah, but so my life was completely different. They were flying us to London to go write with, with you know, with girl groups and, and you know, boy bands and <laughs> had us yeah like working with 13 year old you know phenoms and you know master p's daughter and and i'm in the studio there with p while we're working with his daughter for two straight days dude i learned so much bro. that was just, gonna be my question bro, Yo, did just you learn from p dude, just sitting there chopping up game and you mm -hmm. know i had i was living in richmond where he's from in the bay okay. at, at the time so it was mad love like we were like it was it was mad love. So he, he, he opened up he opened up the textbook, the playbook for me, man, for like two wow. days. And and yeah, bro. And I was just soaking it up, man. Just grateful, grateful, you know, to learn from such an amazing mind. Wow. Let, let me yeah. ask you a question and maybe um just to sort of give people an idea business wise. Right. So you're under contract and you're a writer, producer yeah. for the label mm -hmm. or the publishing house, right? Now, are you getting paid when you get placement or do they have you like, all right, we we're cutting a check for you this way. 
you know, and whatever you get on placement will give you a point or two or, or whatever. So they had my advance uh, staggered out. So I was getting monthly checks, monthly wow. checks from, from them until, until I recouped, you know, whatever the number was that they had given me. And, bro, they were flying us all around the world, mm. putting us up in hotels all around the world, rent to cars, you know what I mean? And it's all recoupable. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's all recoupable, right? They're all recoupable. <laughs> yep. So, you know what I'm saying? When, you, But but you land one record and, and if boom, it's you big. pay that back, you pay that back times 100. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's why we didn't really get a lot of placements is because our publisher, he only want the number one record in the world, bro. He didn't care about like, look, I got this song that's great for, a, you know, a Chevrolet commercial. You know what I'm saying? Or something like that. Yeah, like, yeah. Nah. nah, 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 nah. It's like, you know, because he's on every Britney album and every all the big stuff that was going on at that time. Oh, you wow. know what I'm saying? So, yeah, he is Benjamin Groff, my mentor and uh, publisher from Cobalt that signed me. I learned a lot working with him over the years. So so in that experience, you're flying around the world, you're working mm -hmm. with these artists, you're meeting you're meeting legends, basically. Mm hmm. Um, at any point, does that lifestyle become stale to you? And you're like, yo, you know what? I don't want to do this for these people no more. I want to do my own fucking thing. Or is it you? Are you thriving in the learning? Nah, it was exciting, bro. I was seeing a big pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and I thought I was going to be able to, you know, possibly set my family up in the hills. You know what I mean? Mm. It, you know, it, it didn't really pan out like that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, uh -huh. but we we surviving. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yep. As long as you're eating, that's all that matters, right? That's right. Yeah, my son got food and shelter. He's blessed. Yep. So we blessed. Yeah. How little man's like what, like four or five years old? Four and a half now. Yep. Oh, wow. Yep. How was that? Let me ask you that because I'm we're we're later on in life, and I know me and you are in the same age bracket. Yeah. Yeah. So off top. How does it feel in this moment in your life to to be a father? Man, great. I mean. What was I doing all this time? You know what I mean? This 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 is what I was put on the world on the earth for. So just mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's, it's more appreciative. It's an, it's an amazing. It. Yeah, bro. And I'm kind of glad that I waited, you know, till I was older because I really got to go and travel the world and experience a lot of stuff that I'm gonna be able to teach him. You know what I'm saying? So mm. I don't think I would be able to teach him as good if I had him in my twenties, you know what I mean? Right. Or 30s. <laughs> Different person and still and still evolving. Yeah, as, exactly. That's who you are, right? Right. In the time wouldn't have been, you know, you wouldn't have been able to do all that, you know. Travel. But the crazy thing is, bro, is that so I was I was living in L.A. when uh -huh. he was when he was born. So I had to move to L.A. because I was traveling too much back and forth. So I went and lived there for five years doing the whole songwriting thing. And that's where Jackson was born. Oh, wow. The day he was born, I recorded a song. Mm -hmm. The next day I recorded a song. Ten days straight, I recorded a song. Mm. And it was my album, Phototherapy, that um, that I released uh, a couple of years back. Oh, wow. And, dude, and that was it. It set me, dude, it set me back. It, it was a reset, bro. It brought me back home, man. Ever since then, I don't know what y'all I've been doing. It's just dropping boom, bap, hip-hop. You know, I've been spitting my bars, and I ain't wasting my day writing for Britney Spears or, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> or making beats for this, for, you know, for Peanuts and doing this and that. Like, I'm I'm back to making my art, bro, what I was, what I was trained for right. by so many amazing people. Like, I can't let them down. Like, everyone always used to tell me, like, Jen, you ain't rapping. Like, you were my favorite MC, bro. Like, how come, how come you're not rapping? I'm like, bro, I'm writing pop songs I'm, you know i'm making a few beats here i'm recording a song here and there like i'm just just not what i'm doing right now you know right, right, as right. soon as that boy came it was it was it was on bro you felt a, a resurgence of of creativity it was it was just a reset button just in my life in general man a lot of a lot of change you know nice. a lot of things changed um when Jax came around wow and yeah. how was it how was your and, and I don't mean to pry if you don't want to answer. No, nah, bro, no. Nah, I'm a, I'm a I'm a open window. You see, you hear my music. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. How does how is your is Jackson's mother supportive of what you're doing? Is she that kind of like person? Amazing, always. Yeah, yeah. She's she's the one that dragged me down to L.A. Say, you know what? You need to move down there. You need. It's like I can work wherever. So you let's go. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, nah. She's the biggest, my biggest supporter. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I kind of want to touch on that really quickly because I think that a lot of people, 
you know, in this moment in time, the way the world is, I think a lot of people are deceived into believing that functional relationships and love don't exist, right? And right. they don't really know the order of operation in which they're supposed to be in. Like yeah. a, 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 a woman's place in a man's life is to support him, right? And to, Absolutely. To, to be the eyes and see the things that he doesn't and he, his ears to hear the things that he misses, mm-hmm. right? Not barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. I'm talking about real partnership. Absolutely, 100%. So, so I, I'm under the impression that this person that you've had your son with mm-hmm. is all of these things to you. A million right? percent, yes. So, so how did you know she was that person? Bro, she was... She, I fell in love with her 20 years ago. Really? You heard? Yeah, bro. Tw- yeah, so she was 19. You know what I mean? Oh, shit. And yeah, and I was I was uh, 25, you know, or 24. Okay. And we were young, and I was, dude, I was on top of the city at that time. Like, I was, you know, one of the hottest rappers and in the dopest crews, and and we was, you know, we was running the city, period, you know, with, with all they were with everyone else who was bossing out, you know, we were just performing everywhere and just getting all the accolades and moving mm. units. And so I would now my whole thing was now, nah, now nah, I'm focused on my music. You know, I ain't trying to settle down or nothing. It's cool. It's cool. You know, we cool for the night. That's about <laughs> it. You know what I'm saying? Like I was a player, man. I was out there doing my thing. Right. And then I met her, bro. And I was like, you know, I was, she was the first girl. I was like, yo, like, you, you know, stuck. Will, will you be my girlfriend? You know what I'm saying? Like, can we like, you know, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll we, I can, you know, I can have just you. Yeah. John, that, like I can have just you, you know what I'm saying? And she was not, dude, she was 19, going to college, working, mm-hmm. lived all the way across on the other side of the bay. And mm-hmm. dude, she just, she wasn't into it. <laughs> really? She was not, no, she was not into it. You know, we were still very close and, you know, we you know when you're seeing each other, I don't know what you, what you want to call it. You know what I'm saying? Dating. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dating. Yeah. So I was, you know, I was trying to make it exclusive. Right. She wasn't with it. And eventually, bro, like, you know, my pride got hurt. You know, my feelings got hurt, bro. And I was like, mm. you know what? Like, I know my worth. Like, if you don't want... If you don't want it, you know, I know there's plenty out there that we want me, you know, you know, she was like, yeah, go do that. So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we kind of we drift, we drifted apart and and I let the pride, you know, pride's a bad thing, man. Pride's a bad thing. I let it get the best of me, bro. And it it was all bad. So, so <laughs> she went that way. I went this way. And, bro, and I ended up, you know, meeting someone else, getting married, getting divorced six years later. And dude, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm sitting there. Yeah, this is right around the time where I got, yeah, where I was getting signed and, and like the hyphy movement and all that. And and all of a sudden, I get an email. Uh, and this is like years later, bro. Like I ain't seen her in you know eight years, bro. Right, right, right. And I get an email from her account, and it's like, try Viagra, bro. Like somebody <laughs> hacked, hacked her account, bro. You heard? <laughs> so I do. I answer her back, and I'm like, yo. Yo, change your password. Somebody hacked your account. They're sending out Vi- Viagra ads. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, by the way, how you doing? You know what I'm what's going on, though? What's going on? Yeah, what's popping? <laughs> you know? And so, you know, it's like a year, man, after it was like pretty, pretty, not even a year after I got divorced. Like, it was pretty fresh. And and I told her my whole story. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and she told me, we know what she was going through for the last eight years. You know what I'm saying? And we just, bro, we just fell in love, bro. Head over heels. Like, mm. like I got a song called about it for the second time. Like we fell in love for the second time. You know oh. what I'm saying? Yeah. That's so. how you know it's real. When a nigga put a song together for his man, brother, man. Yeah, you know it's real. Oh, oh no, I was, dude, I was writing songs about her the whole time she was gone. Oh, like Lord. any, any, any song where I was like, you know, talking about missing something. Like I could mm-hmm. write a song about my dad but i'm really talking about you know that's the thing with songwriting you draw the inspiration yeah, for, yeah. for different topics from different situations you know what i'm saying sure. so yeah so you know yeah. I, I i'm 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 very glad uh the way you expressed your your perspective on the relationship between you and jackson's mother because again yeah. in this environment that we're living in a lot of people don't understand that it's important to have that Right? Absolutely. And if Absolutely. a woman is in your life and she does not support you the proper way, you know, you have to do that for each other. 
Yeah. But I, I guess what I'm saying is that I, it's important for people to understand that that's still a real thing. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. <sighs> yeah. I'm tripping, man. I'm, <laughs> really, I'm really tripping out, man. You said I got, I was married and I got the one. Yeah, <laughs> bro, crazy, man. You got to go through, you know, the darkness to so you can really appreciate the light, man. That's a fact. Yeah. So now, where, where, what, what are we expecting to see from Genesee, the artist? Mm -hmm. And what are we hoping to accomplish, you know, in the very near future? Yeah, so I'm really excited. I'm, I'm developing uh, this artist right now out of San Francisco, Little Flower Nasty. And, bro, we just did a whole Motown album, bro. And it's what? like, it's like, it's it's like my best work. Like, I feel like I've I worked my whole career to get to this moment. You know what I mean? Like, this is, dude, it's like, you know, this is what I love. I always, always love 50s music growing up mm. as a kid, you know what I mean? Okay. Like my pops would turn me on to the Beatles and all that stuff. And I kind of did my own dig. Like I would just love, I would know all the words to the 50 songs. And while I'm walking to school, I'll be singing them in my head. You know what I mean? Along with the Omatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro, crazy. So yeah, so this album I'm very excited about. Um, we already released, mm -hmm. we already released a couple singles. Uh, Chuck D actually played it on his podcast uh, a couple weeks ago. No. Which I was, I was as a hip hopper, I was blown away. I was That's, like, yo, wow. amazing. Yeah. So, yes. what's the artist name again? Little Flower Nasty? Yes. And this is in, in what kind of uh, pocket is she singing in? Like, it's, it's, it's straight Motown, bro. It's straight it's Motown. Like, it's like it's what you would list here when you put on like the Amy Winehouse album, where it's Motown with a little bit of a modern, cleaner, cleaner sound. Cause, you know, we're doing stuff in stereo and, and, you know, going for a little bit bigger sound sonically as they had in the 50s. So, but it's still, it's all the production size. I got all uh, musicians that I'm working with that, you know, my boy, shout out to Daniel Cohen. He's my, my beast. He comes up with the stand up bass, the, the electric guitar, the, no the drums, way. everything. Yeah. So we haven't. I got a question. Yeah. Was this recorded digitally or was it analog? Um, analog to digital. <sighs> Yeah, so you know, I'm dump, I'm, I'm wiring up the the big bass, putting the microphone right, there, right, right. even the the Hammond organ with the two, you know, the Ray Charles mm -hmm. Hammond, and yeah. putting the mic on the speaker box, Going and then in. running that channel right into Pro Tools. <sighs> yeah, Man. bro. All right. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna say this. Um, right after my son was born, uh, a, a good friend of mine, Raymond and Emerson, may he rest in peace. He was a 350 pound white rapper. Wow. But he was just imagine, and, and I'm gonna I'm just gonna say this person's name, but I don't want to be disrespectful to this rapper. Just imagine if Coogee Rap was a big fat white guy. Right. Crazy. From, from Borough Park, Brooklyn. Wow. And we were recording in off Houston in Lower Manhattan. Oh wow. In, in the Black Key studio that they had down there. This is before wow. they came out. Wow. And that was the last time that I watched. A Neve and the big reel to reel tape machine. Yeah. Like that was still something back then. Yes. That sound, that warm Yo, sound. Exactly, bro. Yeah, that analog warmth is it's hard. Bananas. I still got my two inch, two inch reels. Oh, for real? From, from Double Life from our first our first <laughs> single, Revolutions. Yep. Yeah. A lot of people are not gonna know what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like these old timers, <laughs> right? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. If you just tuned in, you are shit out of luck. <laughs> you can watch this on the playback on YouTube, The Set 6145. Make sure you go like, share, subscribe. Um, and also, uh, we're going to look up, what, what's the artist's name again? Flower? Lil Flower Nasty. L-I-L, uh -huh. Flower Nasty with the I. And where can they find you, um, Genesee? Oh, Tell everybody where, you, where they can find you. Yeah, I got my new releases out right now. I'm in a group called Five Star. We just dropped our single God Body. Um, mm. we, yeah, and it's just, it's bars. Bars and beats, bro. Boom, Is bap. It, what platforms can they find it on? Everywhere. Everywhere. And just search Genesee uh, Throwback Classic. This is my my uh, most recent album, and I already dropped 10 singles off uh, Throwback Classic Volume 2, which is dropping... Uh, actually in December. So ladies and gentlemen, um, during this week, I'm going to post up new hits from, from Genesee. 
I'm going to pull up Little Flower Nasty. We're going to post her music up on the Instagram. Make sure you go check that out. Bro, I'm going to tuck you away in the green room and close the show, but I, because <laughs> I need at least a little five minutes to talk to you before we get up and out of here. All okay. good, Papa. All good. Of course, right. I'm here. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, by Brooklyn's own, by way of Cali, the man, the myth, the legend, Genesee Lewis. Don't Snoop. disappear, yo. Stay tough. Shout out right? James and Tom on my NY cats. I see you. Much love always. Time oh, passes, wow. but the love remains the same. Believe that. Let's go. Yeah. Don't move, all right? Word up. Ladies and gentlemen, um, one of the best conversations I've had in a while. Um, and as you probably understand, there's history between me and Mr. Lewis that goes back a lot of time. And a lot of brothers in the building, James. And Charles, you brothers were definitely a part of the movement and saw all that stuff firsthand. Um, so I'm glad everybody could join us. And um, this Sunday, we're going to have another guest from Miami, Florida. His name is Mr. Dominique Rashad. He's the CEO of Urban Alchemist Clothing Line. He's from Baltimore, but he's coming to us by way of Miami. And I hope everybody could join us for that. We'll also have another segment this Wednesday. Make sure you come and check it out. I appreciate all of y'all for coming into the room. Man, I I thoroughly enjoyed <laughs> this conversation. It, it was really, you know, amazing to reconnect with, with the boy because we haven't spoken in so many years. But um, I really appreciate it, and I hope everybody comes out next week. I'll see you people. Take care. <laughs>